down here he's listing, you know, all these people, these wicked modern teachers. Um, as far as I know, these people have Babel buildings. All those people listed. They aren't preaching in home fellowships. They have Babel buildings. But you see, Rick Warren and, you know, Charles Swindle and Bill Hybels and Beth Moore and David Jeremiah and Max Lucado and Philip Yancey and Lee Strobel and all these other guys, Brennan Manning and all this stuff like that. They're not building the one world church. See, that's the fault of the house church people. You know, the house church people are the bad ones. They are the satanic agenda, the satanic people out there like me that are building the house church movement and defending this satanic heresy. But those people like Rick Warren and stuff, well, they're bad. They just aren't part of the, the new world order, one world church system that's coming. Here we have page 101. These are only some of the heresies that populate the jungle of the house church movement today. You know, talking about all this weird new age stuff up here. Whatever. Doesn't popular, populate the uh, house churches I've ever been around. Here we have scriptures misused by the house church movement. Uh, talking about different things here. You can read some of that stuff. Um, of course, the verse there in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. This confuses a fellowship of believers with a New Testament church. <laughs> what is a New Testament church there, David Cloud? Proper church by the biblical standard. <laughs> and that's a building where people come together and stuff like this. And Can't give one verse of scripture to prove that people are meeting in temples or in church buildings, you know, Christian temples, I should say it that way, because then people will go, well, they met in the temple in the book of Acts. Yes, it was a Jewish temple. That's why they were going to prison for meeting there. That's why there were problems all the time. Okay, there were no temples that they called Christian temples. Page 102 here. A church typically begins with the fellowshipping together of a few saints, but to be a proper New Testament church, more than this is required. Really? So to be a proper New Testament church, you have to do things that are not in the New Testament. And we're the ones that have a satanic agenda? Let me tell you what the satanic agenda is there before we continue. The satanic agenda is to get people into this mindset that they have to be part of a building to worship God. And they can't worship the Lord on their own. That's a satanic agenda. You see, because then the Antichrist system can come in and the whole world worships the beast. Hey, where do you worship on Sunday? You see, most people think of a church building, don't they? Mm -hmm. Most people, it's very foreign to them to think of worshiping with other people in a home, in a field, in the woods. They don't think about that. Well, you have to be part of a church. You have to be part of a New Testament church. You see how this satanic movement has come in whereby real true Bible-believing groups of Christians that are part of the church seven days a week, 24 hours a day, those people that are part of that, now all of a sudden their minds have been switched to now the church has become a building. And so I can go to the building and I can act a certain way and then I get the time off when I'm out of that place. I can go to work and I can tell dirty jokes or listen to dirty jokes or laugh at dirty jokes. I can watch things on television because after all, I'm not in church. And how many times have I heard professing Christians and they say, I wouldn't do this in church, but you see, that's what the church building has created. So if you want to talk about a satanic agenda, the church building is it. Not people meeting in homes. Here he says, page 103, this is another major proof text used by the house church movement. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. Again, it's used by this faction over here, the liberals, to try to say that every member should be functioning. And again, I've condemned that. That's not what the Bible is teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. It's actually a condemnation there. Paul is saying there needs to be order within the assembly of the saints. So again, you can't teach that all house churches teach this way, and this is another one used by the house church movement. It's not true. 
Page 105, much freedom in this matter so that churches can be adapted to every time and culture. So we should just adapt to the times, right? Acts 5.42 says that the apostles preached from house to house. And Acts 15.35 says Paul and Barnabas preached in the church at Antioch. Really? That was Acts 15 verse 35. It says that they preached in the church at Antioch, according to David Cloud. Acts chapter 15. I'll show you it one more time. Acts 15, 35 says Paul and Barnabas preached in the church at Antioch. Here we have chapter 16. Verse 35, Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So wait a second. David Cloud wouldn't outright lie, would he? He just did. Right in his book. Right there. Do you see anything about Paul and Barnabas preaching in the church? Paul and Barnabas preached in in the church at Antioch. You see how the liar does it? He wants you to believe he's a King James Bible believing Christian. I believe the King James Bible. It's the written word of God. You know, it's the infallible word of God. You know, capital W. I, I, I believe it. I believe from cover to cover. And then he outright lies to you right there in his book. Comes out and lies right in your face lies to you to make you believe that they had a building there that they called a church. Because if you preach in the church, that would be a building. Why did you lie, David Cloud? Next chapter here, the legalism of the house church movement. Yeah, sure. And it is exalting human tradition to the same level of authority as Scripture as the Pharisees did. Hello, Pharisee, David Cloud. To make the silence of Scripture an authority is to commit the sin of legalism. Then you're legalistic. By your own standards, there, Cloud. The house church movement is filled with true legalism, particularly in the sense of adding tradition to the Word of God and making laws on the basis of the Bible's silence. What? Are you serious? I mean, this is insane. You know, you're, you know, the house church is, is movement is true legalism because they're making laws based on the Bible's silence. That's what you're doing. That's what this whole book is about. Telling people that they have to be part of a New Testament church. And your definition of New Testament church isn't anywhere at all in Scripture. But we're the ones with the satanic agenda. Down here, page 109. Nowhere does the Bible forbid a congregation to own property or to have its own building. Even if it were true that churches didn't have buildings before the 3rd century, this means nothing. Further, it is an argument largely from silence since most of the record from the first two centuries has not survived. Okay, well then by that philosophy, nowhere does the Bible forbid a congregation to own property or to have its own building. Well then, nowhere does the Bible expressly forbid uh, you to have a collection of every issue of Playboy for the year 2013. It doesn't openly say it. Does the Bible openly condemn heroin or bath salts? How about methamphetamines? Hey, the Bible doesn't openly condemn it, so it must be okay. I thought the Bible talked about, there in Acts chapter 7, how be it the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Why would Stephen have said that? Because those people that he was speaking to were worshiping the temple. Like a lot of the independent fundamental Baptists do today with their church buildings. You say, Brian, come on, that's ridiculous. Okay, go into the average independent fundamental Baptist church and knock over the pulpit see what happens 
go up and just, you know, trip and fall, knock the offering plates off or something like this. I'd be like, oh, you've defiled the holy temple. Oh, yeah. Page 110. After the laws changed in the 1990s, there was more freedom. Churches began to purchase property. It was a simple matter of practicality. So in other words, then, the way the thing that gives you the right to build the Babel buildings, church buildings, you know, is uh, the political atmosphere. Not whether or not God told you to do it. It's just, can we get by, you know, do this thing and the politicians won't come down on us. That's real scriptural. Down here he says, Nowhere does the New Testament forbid a church to meet in a building other than a house. In fact, Paul indicates in 1 Corinthians 11.22 that the church at Corinth met somewhere other than a house for their main services. Oh, really? 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22. What have ye not houses to eat and drink and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Oh, well, then see that they met in other places other than their homes. No, what he's saying is, you're coming from your private house, coming here to the assembling of the saints, wherever that was. And when the assembling of the saints get together, those people are the church of God. Okay? And you leave your home to come here out to the forest or come out, out here to the field or to wherever. It wasn't a building. And you come in here and you are got this foot-long sub and you're sitting there snacking on the thing and everybody else doesn't have anything like that. That's what Paul's condemning. All right? He's not saying that you come in here, you shouldn't bring your foot-long sub into the, the church of God, the house of God. He's not saying that. He's not referring to a building. Again, lying here. Again, it says, the bottom line is that nowhere does the New Testament indicate that it is wrong for a church to rent or to own a building. If a church needs a building, let it have a building. Sure. If you want to be $500,000 or more in debt, go ahead. Yes, it's wonderful. Put a noose around your neck. Make yourself 501c3. Get under the federal government's control. And then they can run you. And, you know, just like they did in uh, communist Romania. Richard Vernbrand talking about that, how the churches over there were organized by the government and controlled by the government. Sure. Oh, but it'll never happen in America because in America, we have freedom and we're going to be guaranteed freedom. We're God's country, bless the Lord. Yeah, maybe the God of this world, but uh, certainly not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Down here he says, where a church meets is irrelevant. I disagree. Because when you go into a building and you call that thing a church, all kinds of unscriptural things start to happen. As we've all seen. Unless you have your head in the sand like David Cloud. Next page, 111 here, he says, it's a simple matter of practicality and to make a doctrine about buildings is to make laws beyond scripture, which is true legalism. So in other words, you can't go with the plain teachings of Scripture that say people are meeting in homes to go beyond and say, you know, that you shouldn't do that. Somehow that's legalism. But they go beyond and use, you know, church buildings. But that's not legalism. Here he says, many house churches are legalistic about Sunday school and youth ministries. Many house churches not only don't have Sunday schools or youth ministries, they claim that these are unscriptural. They are. This is an argument from the silence of Scripture, which is no argument at all. Again, we're back to this thing. If the Bible doesn't openly condemn it by specific name, then it's okay. Well, man, if that's your standard, you can get by with all kinds of stuff. You want to talk about the silence of Scripture? There's all kinds of things that the Bible does not openly condemn by name. But you can see it there. Go back through the book of Proverbs and show me one place where it says that anybody else but a parent should be teaching the children. There aren't any. Here he says about, uh, this is such an important truth. The Bible says nothing one way or the other about Sunday school or VBS or a children's ministry. He's lying to you again. Churches are to preach the gospel to every creature. 
preach the gospel to every creature. Okay? And you're to preach the gospel to children, young children that can't understand, but they can raise their hand and pray a little prayer and repeat after me. One, two, three, repeat after me and you get the candy. You know? You can do that. And that's preaching the gospel to every creature. But let's see what he does here with this. Again, we're going to see some real lying coming out here. Down the page he says, Sunday school is neither scriptural nor unscriptural. Accomplish the Lord's great commission. What's the great commission? Preach the gospel. You got that? Let's look at the next page. Uh, they avoid these ministries out of conviction, claiming that it is only the job of families to teach children and youth, but there is absolutely nothing in Scripture that forbids churches from teaching them. So we're back to the thing of defining churches here as buildings, even though he's never been able to prove that buildings are, or that churches are buildings in the New Testament. But look at this. In fact, the churches have a commission from Christ to teach everyone. Christ put no limit on the Great Commission. The Great Commission is to go out and preach the gospel. Right here he says, Christ said to teach everyone. No, he didn't. That's not the Great Commission. The Great Commission is not to teach everyone, you stinking liar. I mean, you forked tongue liar, you. You just said over here, right on that, I mean, you are contradicting yourself every other page within paragraphs of each other. You're, con you're contradicting yourself. Over here, the Great Commission is preaching the gospel to every creature. The very next page, page 112, it's teaching people. You got some serious problems, David Cloud. You got some very serious problems, and you better get them fixed up. Because God's not going to put up with much more of your lying, double-tongued foolishness. No one can take the Bible and say that this is wrong, and no one can therefore rightly condemn it. We've heard that before. I can condemn you right and left from the Bible. Many house churches are legalistic about single women. As we will see that in the chapter of the, on the integrated church, there is legalism pertaining to what a young unmarried woman can and cannot do. A review by a fundamentalist homeschooling mother. He's talking about this review of the Vision Forum book and DVD. Uh, Return of the Daughters or whatever I think it was called. Um, why don't you tell us her name? He doesn't. How do we know that this isn't your wife, David Cloud? We'll never know. No name's ever given. Hmm. Interesting. Kind of a funny way to get documentation. But, you know, there's legalism pertaining to what a young unmarried woman can and cannot do. Over here it says, To teach that young women cannot leave their father's roof unless they are married is going beyond Scripture and putting man-made yokes on God's people. The Bible is our sole authority for faith and practice. Okay. The book of 1 Timothy. First Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5, verse, uh, let's see here, verse 14, I will therefore that the young women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after David, uh, and, <coughs> excuse me, Satan, little slip of the tongue there, I'm sure. The Bible doesn't really say what young women are supposed to do. I mean, it, it, it's really kind of this, the Bible's silence again. Now, the Bible does say what young women are supposed to do. Plain as day. It does not say go on out and get it yourself a good career so that you get used to the second income there. And then when you get, a, a, get married, then you both work hard and stuff like that so you get all the money coming in and everything else so, until you become with child and then you can stop your job and at least until the children are older and then you can go back out into the career field. 
You know, up, up until the last hundred or so, so years, women weren't out there in the career field. But with feminism and all this other satanic nonsense, women are going out and they're getting careers and they're getting messed up. But I guess that's okay because the scripture's silence on the issue. Yeah. Page 115. The doctrine of apostasy, a glaring omission in house church writings. Well, that depends on what you mean by house churches. Nowhere in the writings of prominent house church leaders have I found clear warnings about end time apostasy and the great spiritual danger that exists throughout Christianity in our day. Uh, well, who does he define as the leaders of the house church movement? So you see, you can kind of slant the book to make it say what you want to do, you know? Kind of slant the whole thing. The house church movement is run by a bunch of liberal lunatics like that over there. We won't talk about Bible believers that are sick and tired of the Babel buildings and meeting in their homes now. Let's not talk about that. Because then our study wouldn't, wouldn't weigh so heavily in favor of our Babel buildings. Down here he says, As we have seen, most house church people are not looking for the imminent rapture of New Testament saints, preceded by great apostasy and followed immediately by the brief reign of the Antichrist. The understanding of end-time apostasy is necessary to have a proper Christian worldview for these times. Okay. Um, how about the Babel buildings? How do they fit into the whole thing? Here again, he condemns theological modernism. Kind of like the people that uh, profess to believe in the King James Bible, but don't really, you know. The mainstream news media rages against God and flaunts his laws and regularly cast doubt upon his word. Kind of like David Cloud. Okay, uh, down here, this is just a mistake that he made here. Battle of Armageddon in Joel chapter 3, verses 9 through 14. And chapter 14, 17 through 20, and 19, 11 through 21. Forgot to put the word revelation in there. Uh, unless David Cloud's Bible has a chapter 14 and a chapter 19 in the book of Joel. I mean, hey, if you don't believe in the inspired word of God as a King James Bible, you know, you might as well just add in some chapters here and there. What's the big deal? You know? <laughs> you know, God's word rather than man's opinion will be the law. Sure, Cloud. We're for you. We're behind you 100%. Not likely. He commends judgment of false teachers. We judge them by God's word. You know, I love that. Page 124. We judge people by God's word. And what is God's word? It's not the King James Bible, you know. Salvation requires receiving the word of God. Written word or manifest word? Well, according to that capital W, that would be the manifest word. So I guess you can get, you know, to reading the written word of God, and that's not really that important. Here again, he says they speak perverse things. The Greek word is diastrepho, and it is also translated turn away, Acts chapter 13, verse 8. It refers to any false teaching that turns people away from the truth. Kind of like referring Greek to Greek words there, getting people to mess around with that. The word of God is sufficient and effective. It is the final authority for faith and practice among the churches. Paul did not appeal to a church council or to tradition. He appealed directly to the scriptures. Capital W, word of God. And David Cloud's just exactly like Paul. Sure he is. Page 140. We see in verse 4 that the teaching of the apostles is the absolute standard for the truth. Were they teaching about church buildings? Well, no, but the silence of the scriptures allows us to have church buildings. So the teaching of the apostles is the standard for the absolute truth, but we base our truth today on the silence of the scriptures. Boy, what a foundation, huh? Kind of like quicksand. We have the teaching of the apostles in the New Testament scriptures. This is the faith once delivered to the saints by which we are to measure teaching and practice we don't need later traditions i'm not even going to bother commenting on that one 
Okay, because I've just the same thing over and over and over again here. Being able to see both sides is not a mark of spirituality. There is only one side of the truth. The way of truth is narrow. It's not the truth of the Bible. It's just, you know, the Bible's silence that allows us to be able to do the things that we do today, even though those things aren't found in Scripture. Yeah. Here he says, page 142, the lion particularly looks for stragglers and for the young. This is why every believer needs a good church for spiritual growth and protection. Getting into a good church. Um, how many new Christians are destroyed when they go to a church? I know of lots of them. I mean, I've heard the, the nightmare stories of independent fundamental Baptist churches. People going to these places and the pastor's pulling off all kinds of things. And, you know, I uh, remember one story this guy told me about how that his pastor divorced his wife and married a woman. She's an IRS agent. You know, you got all the pastors that are on the FEMA payroll that are basically going to betray their congregations, their flocks, when things get bad in the country. Again, documented fact. But you're safe in the church buildings. Out on your own with you and the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to teach you the Word of God and maybe some good preaching and teaching and stuff like that. Boy, your goose is cooked out there. All right. I mean, you're in serious trouble of being deceived out there. I mean, the thought of being alone with the Lord and the Bible, oh, that's scary, isn't it? Isn't that such a scary thing? You're so much safer in the Babel buildings that are controlled by the IRS through 501c3. You're safe there. Here we go again, playing the old uh, lying thing. The Bible is the final authority. It is the sole authority for faith and practice. It is the ultimate test of truth, and everything is to be examined by this standard. <laughs> uh, it's so disgusting. Those who do not carefully test everything by the absolute standard of God's word, but who trust their spiritual intuitions are easily deceived, though they think they though they often think their way is superior to the strict Bible way. Which is exactly what David Cloud is trying to do. You know, deceive people and it's not the Bible way. It's not what the Bible actually says about their meeting in homes and houses and stuff like that. No, no. The Bible's silence allows us to have church buildings. Because it doesn't openly condemn them by name. You know, nowhere does it say, Thou shalt not have a First Baptist Church that's worth $500,000 in your mortgage to the bank and 501c3 to the government. Nowhere does it say, Nowhere does it openly condemn that. So, brethren, there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> you know, woo, crazy. Every church should be a Bible training school to produce strong believers. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth. Well, I can honestly say every Babel building I've ever gone to, I've learned almost nothing. Um, I have learned a lot of things that are bad, uh, so I'm kind of thankful for that. You know, I've, I've learned and seen a lot of people that have a bad life and bad examples and things. So I have learned some things in the Babel buildings. But for the most part, it's the same stuff I learned in Sunday school when I was a kid. You know, five weeks of how to give your money to keep the Babel building going. Six weeks of how to pray, you know, eight weeks of, of uh, how to go out and, and knock on doors to invite people to the Babel building because we're suffering in numbers and we got to get more people in. But boy, you just don't dare miss those services. Got to get in there. Page 146. The apostles are the divinely given examples for the churches to imitate and their writings are the standards of truth and righteousness. <laughs> Oh, it's disgusting. False teaching is no light matter. I agree. So let's throw the book out. Crazy. Here we go again. Page 148. False teachers want to rob believers of their absolute confidence in the truth of God's word and in the pure grace of Christ and to replace us with human tradition and philosophy. Look out for them false teachers. You know, you can trust David Cloud. I mean, he's doing the same thing that he's condemning false teachers for doing, but 
it's not the same because see, David Cloud's real, even though he's doing the same thing that the false teachers do. You can trust David Cloud, but just don't trust the false teachers that are doing the same thing as David Cloud. It's clear as mud, right? Down here he says, false teachers add to God's word. The way to defeat them is to hold fast to the Bible as the divinely inspired word of God and as the sole authority for faith and practice. Um, we're to hold fast to the Bible as the divinely inspired word of God. Is this the divinely inspired word of God, David Cloud? The King James Bible? Let me show you a little page here from the Hiles Effect. Page 82. The dilemma arises, this, this chapter here in, in the Hiles Effect thing, King James Bible nuttiness. Okay? And he, you know, he stands for its textual basis, textual purity, and translational accuracy. Uh-huh. But there is a large element within the IFB movement that treats the King James Bible in a truly nutty fashion. And what is this truly nutty fashion? The dilemma arises because of the nutty, cultic approach to the King James Bible, which actually stems from Peter Ruckman with his heresies that the King James Bible is more than an accurate translation of the preserved Word of God. Again, he does the capital W. That it is, in fact, advanced revelation over the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and that the King James Version was actually given by inspiration. This confuses the continuing process of Bible translation with the once-for-all process of divine inspiration. The way to defeat them is to hold fast to the Bible as the divinely inspired Word of God and as the sole authority for faith and practice. And he quotes from an English Bible. So over here, in the Hiles Effect, your King James Bible nuttiness, cultic, Peter Ruckmanite type of stuff, holding to the Bible as the divinely inspired Word of God. In the house church movement, you're to hold to the Bible as the divinely inspired Word of God. Calling David Cloud a liar just seems kind of nice to me. Do you reckon it's the Holy Spirit that's leading him to talk like this? Write these things in his book? I don't think so. But that's right. I'm part of the satanic agenda, the house church movement. But David Cloud's a holy, righteous man that you can trust. Next page, page 150. In the 19th century, for example, there was an explosion of apostasy. Talking about textual criticism. And yet David Cloud toes the party line of the modern Alexandrian textual critics that there is no perfect word of God. There is no divinely inspired word of God. You say, well, it's not the King James Bible. What is it? Well, it's the Greek and Hebrew. Oh, really? Which edition? Which edition of which text? Well, you know, um, um, uh, 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 uh -huh. and you talk to these guys and you talk to them and you basically get them back to the original autographs where the only divinely inspired word of God and nothing since then has been inspired. Nothing since then has carried through that line of inspiration. Incredible. Page 152. See it there? Apostolic teaching is the standard of truth. Timothy was to test every doctrine against that which he had learned from Paul and was not to allow any variation from this standard then why are you allowing variations with your church buildings? Number two, churches are to be very strict about doctrine. No other doctrine, doctrinal broad-mindedness is not the path of true Christianity. Just kind of shoots himself in the foot over and over again. Well, at least his feet are holy then. Page 153. Is theological modernism that uses science to cast doubt upon the Bible. Kind of like your modern uh, textual criticism type of stuff there, David Cloud. Error produces unanswered questions, confusion, and doubt. Like this book, Speaking Lies and Hypocrisy. 
Yeah, kind of like the men that stand up in the pulpit and say, the Word of God teaches the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. And you say, oh, that book in your hand? Oh, no, 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 not, not this. The Word of God is a capital W. It's Jesus Christ. That's the only divinely inspired, infallible, inerrant, you know, whatever, Word of God. They speak lies and hypocrisy, which I've been documenting over and over and over again in this book. Down here he says, The Bible never prophesies of a great revival of truth at the end of the age, but it frequently warns of apostasy. Okay, when did the independent fundamental Baptist church buildings show up? In the end times. How are the people going to worship the image of the beast? In Babel buildings. What is the apostasy? The house church movement. Uh, no, it's Babel buildings. Page 154. We have an absolute standard by which to test uh, teaching the faith. The New Testament faith was given by the Holy Spirit through chosen men. False teaching originates with devils. This is why there is so, such a powerful attraction to error and why so many people are deceived. The problem is not intellectual, it is spiritual. False teachers are deceitful, seducing spirits. Verse 1, speaking lies. <laughs> uh, do you realize what you're saying about yourself there, David Cloud? You're admitting that you have devils within you? You've been speaking lies throughout this thing. You've been speaking lie after lie after lie. I mean, I'm documented. You say at one point, the Great Commission is preaching the gospel. Then you say, actually, the Great Commission is teaching people. That's a lie. You said that Paul and Barnabas preached in the church in Acts chapter, it says, the Bible says that they preached in the church in Acts chapter 15, verse 35. We went to the verse. It said nothing of the kind. You put capital W over here, and then down here you put lowercase w for the written Word of God. You say that you should believe in the divinely inspired Word of God and refer to an English set of scriptures. But then over in this book you say, King James Bible nuttiness, believe that the Bible itself is the inspired Word of God, the King James Bible. Maybe you ought to cast those devils out of yourself. Down here, number six. False teachers have a seared conscience. There is something wrong with the false teacher's heart. He has willfully rejected the truth. Hi, David Cloud. How you doing, false teacher? These particular false teachers corrupted the doctrine according to godliness. They argued against the plain teaching of Scripture. Just keep shooting yourself in the foot, man. It's incredible. Man-centered gospels, i.e. the church growth movement that focuses on the felt needs of man rather than the glory of God and strict obedience to the Bible. Didn't he say earlier that we should, we should change the thing of, of getting to children and teaching children where they're at? But here he's condemning that. Man felt needs. We shouldn't do that. But you, you can as long as it's to children in Sunday school. Page 162. The reason they are never able to come to the knowledge of the truth is because they have rejected the Bible as the infallible Word of God and the sole authority for faith and practice. The latest critical theories and in other places. Talking about other things there. Apostates resist the truth. Well then, David Cloud, you're an apostate. By your own standards, put forth in your own book. Then here he talks about, you know, talking about all this other stuff here, all this wickedness and, and modern modernism and everything. Look at this. The contemporary churches are satisfying this itch. But I thought it was the house church movement that was bringing in the end times apostasy and the end times one world church of the Antichrist. But here you're condemning the church buildings. Victory comes through apostolic faith and practice. The apostles are the standard. Okay, for the hundredth time, show me one apostle that's worshiping in a building called a church. That's all you got to do. 
Victory comes through the infallible scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. The victory over apostasy is to stand unmovable in the word of God as the divinely inspired word of God, verbally and plenarily, where the Bible is truly the sole authority for faith and practice and every teaching is caref carefully compared to the scriptures, error cannot enter. Well, then you are again shooting yourself in the foot and admitting the fact that your errors that have entered in here is because you don't follow the divinely inspired word of God. You don't believe in it for one second. You're just fooling people the whole way through this book. You're just lying to people. You're a deceiver. Talk about false prophet. Again, up here, again, we're talking, what, two paragraphs later? He's back to writing capital W, Word of God, which is a reference to the manifest Word of God. The man who is incapable of dealing with error or refuses to deal with it is not qualified to lead a church. This means that a great many pastors today are disqualified, including you, David Cloud. Lying hypocrite. Sometimes sharp rebukes are necessary to keep God's people in the truth, which is what I'm doing. That's exactly what I'm doing. Some of you aren't going to be able to handle it. Some of you are going to be like, I don't appreciate the way you're writing and saying this thing. And you shouldn't be attacking David Cloud. He's a good man, blah, 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 blah. And he's older than you and blah, blah, blah. Let no man despise thy youth, whatever. You know, he's lying in this book. Lying and lying and lying and lying. Here it says these false teachers are proud, self-willed, presumptuous. Presumption is to despise God's word and to disobey it knowingly and brazenly. You realize, uh, David Cloud, if you are saved, and I have to wonder sometimes here, good night, man. If you are saved, you realize the fun the Lord's going to have with you at the judgment seat of Christ with this book? You realize you're going to get up there and you're going to have to give an account for all this nonsense that you've written? Good night, man. I wouldn't want to answer for this stuff. Crazy. Page 178. The Bible is the absolute standard that protects us from false teachers. Thank you, David Cloud. I'm protected from you by this book. Thank you very much for acknowledging that. Here we go again. Page 181, we see the scoffer's rejection of God's word, 2 Peter 3, 5. The major object of the scoffer's attack is the Bible. Since the 19th century, the battle for the divine inspiration of the Bible has grown increasingly fierce and the skepticism has increased dramatically. This has been the focus of attack by theological modernism. Maybe, I mean, David Cloud, do you just sit at home and punch yourself in the face or something? I mean, page after page after page after page, you're attacking yourself. I mean, this, this book is spiritual suicide, is what this thing is. You're killing yourself, man. You talk about condemning yourself, you know? Page 186, Christians must be very careful and test everything by the Word of God. Capital W again. Amazing how a man that uh, claims to be a great preacher and everything, amazing how you can't get the differences be between a capital W Word of God and a lowercase w written Word of God. How about that? Page 197. Why organic church is spreading? There are many reasons why the organic church in particular and the house church concept in general are spreading. Uh, one reason is apostasy and compromise. The fourth reason for the growth of the house church movement is the lack of education in so many churches. Gee, I wonder why that would be. Because you got to get people into your little Bible building, you got to put on your performance, and then you got to get them out in time so they can go home and, and you know, take the roast out of the oven. You can't spend a couple of hours preaching the Word of God. That's just, that ruins our schedule. Here he talks about again about an attack upon owning a building. Yeah. Well, you should. Page 202. 
you see 202. Viola goes to great lengths in his attempt to prove the previous statements, but in the process he twists scripture out of context, abuses the Greek, and ignores the plain meaning of God's word in the most frightful, heretical manner. Same thing that David Cloud does. Exactly the same thing. And now watch. Abuses the Greek, ignores the plain meaning of God's word in the most frightful, heretical manner. Follow the birdie. Over here he goes. The Greek word for rule here is also translated chief. There are certain men in the churches with ruling authority, and the saints are to submit to them as long as they are leading God according to God's word. Their authority is not their own opinion. Their authority is God's word. <laughs> oh, man, it just gets so ridiculous after a while. You know, he over in this one, he's condemning the house church liberals like this guy, Frank Viola, and you're all right across the page, he's doing the same thing. Yeah. Page 206. In fact, a multi-headed body is a strange thing, and in strictly pr practical terms, it is more natural and reasonable that one man will have more authority than others. He's kind of just repeating some of the stuff he said earlier in the book here. Um, Viola and Barna complain that the pulpit elevates the clergy to a position of prominence. Maybe that is true in the Catholic Church, but it is not true in a Bible-believing church. In a Bible-believing church, the pulpit does not exalt a man. It exalts the Word of God that the man is preaching, you know. And down here he says, it is wise to honor this position and activity in the house of God. Okay. And he writes a book against Jack Hiles. They believe the King James Bible. They believed it was the Word of God, divinely inspired and all that other stuff. They didn't elevate the Scriptures. They elevated Jack Hiles. To the point where the guy is fornicating and doing all kinds of stuff and just money, greed, all kinds of corruption out there. Womanizer, you know, takes his deacon's wife from him for crying out loud. And it's just like, dude, I don't see anything. I don't see a thing, you know. Why? They're worshiping him. But that's not going to happen in church buildings. Yeah, sure. Here he says on page 208, while it is true that Rome's doctrine of sacred church buildings and cathedrals is unscriptural, this does not mean that there is anything wrong with a church having its own building. Nowhere does the Bible forbid a congregation to own property or to have its own building. Even if it were true, the churches didn't have buildings before the third century. This means nothing. Again, this is a lot of stuff he's repeating here. After the laws changed in the 1990s and there was more freedom, churches began to purchase property. It was a simple matter of practicality. The bottom line is that nowhere does the New Testament indicate that it is wrong for a church to rent or own a building. If a church needs a building, let it have a building. It's none of the business of Frank Viola or George Barna or anyone else. I guess the Holy Spirit, too. It's not really any of his business. I mean, you know, if you want to get into debt and have this huge, big mortgage building and stuff like that that's run by the federal government, whose business is that? You know, stay out of our business. Let us do it. Sure. Where a church meets is irrelevant. It can meet in a home, a barn, a storefront, or its own building. It's simply a matter. It's a simple matter of practicality, and to make a doctrine about buildings is to make laws beyond Scripture, which is true Phariseeism. Sure, on the basis of the Bible silence, Viola further condemns Sunday schools, tithing, dressing up for church, altar calls, and other things none of which are forbidden by the Bible. Already talked about that. Sheep stealing any path to control. Oh boy, it's kind of funny because I had Catholics say this about me. You know, well, there's certainly no, there's no comparison between Catholics and independent fundamental Baptists. They're diametrically opposed to them, to each other. They're, they're totally different systems. Don't ever make the error of comparing them. Just kidding. Uh, talks about sheep stealing movement. People who pull out of traditional churches and think they have the authority to be a church simply by meeting together with a few other people. Um, you don't need authority to be the church. If you are saved, you are the church. It's not a question of authority. It's a question of what the Bible teaches. Uh, I like this one here. 
Further, churches are instructed to hold to and contend for the one New Testament faith, Jude 3. They are to allow no other doctrine, 1 Timothy 1, 3, and they are warned that apostasy will explode at the end of the age, and this require, requires that Bible-believing churches be disjointed in fellowship from the majority of churches that are moving with the apostasy. Again, this separatism on the basis of doctrine is not a matter of concern. It is faithfulness to God's word. Amen. That's exactly true. That's why we're involved in the house church movement. Here he says, this is pure neo-orthodox heresy, which claims that the Bible itself is not infallible, that only Jesus is infallible, and that revelation is given to the individual directly rather than mediated through Scripture. The Bible becomes the Word of God only as we experience it as the Word of God. This denies what the Bible says about itself, that it is propositionally the infallible Word of God. Then he gives scriptures from the King James Bible. Then he talks about the written Word of God here, the Word of God. Lowercase w. Again, this is this is deception. There's no other nice way for me to put it. Again, he says, we are to mark and avoid them which teach contrary to apostolic doctrine. Like I said, again, that's what I'm doing with this study. Uh, we're getting just about through here. Here he talks about the dangers. This is page 234. The integrated church has often led to the downplaying of the importance of the biblical church. He never defined what the biblical church is. Never defined it as the people. You know, he keeps going with this thing of, well, the Bible's silence really allows us to do what, pretty much whatever we want. That's not the biblical church. Many have replaced a biblical church with home church, where the fathers are the pastors. Others have tried to start churches with a few homeschooling families, though they aren't qualified and divinely called to the task. Oh, really? Oh, really? I know a lot of families that have home fellowships. I don't care if it's just your own family. Many times it's far more scriptural and in line with the Bible than going to some stupid Babel building someplace. Incredible. Here he talks again about New Testament churches. Never defines it. You know, he leads you to believe that a New Testament church is what he has, and it isn't. This church appears to be the exception rather than the rule. Talking about, you know, some house churches and things like this. Here again, another lying statement. The integrated church is legalistic, having gone beyond the Bible and making rules about family and church. He makes the statement while he himself is part of that Babel building system. Hypocrisy. It is legalistic to make laws that go beyond the biblical bounds. Just like David Cloud has been doing the whole way through the book. The Bible says nothing about this one way or the other. Teach children and young people separately from the adults. This is not contrary to any scripture. Oh, yes it is. And you have your children going off to somebody back there in the uh, Sunday school, you know, Sunday school teacher. You have no idea what they're teaching your child. I mean, again, you know, how many Babel buildings out there have got perverts teaching in the Sunday school department? You say, well, that's okay, Brian, because we can go down to the police station and have state background checks. Merging secular with religious institutions, you know, that's okay. You know, we, we, we can do that. That's good and everything else. Sure it is. Down here, the Bible nowhere says that they must always be with their parents. That is to make a law out of the Bible's silence. Oh, uh, yes, it does. I mean, who is the spiritual head of the, of the children? The pastor? No. The Sunday school teacher? No. The father? All right, again, you go to some Babel building somewhere and this pastor usurps the authority of the Father. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 talks about a woman's to keep silence and if she learns any, if she wants to ask any questions, she's to ask her husband at home, not the pastor. Hmm. Sunday school is neither a pillar of the faith nor a heresy. It is simply a tool. A yeah, tool of the devil. The typical Sunday school is today is part evangelistic and part discipleship. 
Yeah, evangelize children that are too young to understand what they're doing and will do make decisions and pray prayers and end up, you know, to get candy and then they end up later on becoming atheists. To go beyond this and make such things a law for everyone is to go beyond scripture. Yeah, like you wouldn't do that. You know, and, and again, he talks about this whole thing here, review by a fundamentalist homeschooling mother. Again, a lot of this is, is the same thing he's been writing earlier. Here this fundamentalist homeschooling mother says, it warned daughters against an independent spirit and self-sufficiency to the point of calling working for anyone other than your dad selfish and Marxist. Marxism did talk about breaking up the family, getting the children out into the workforce. It is selfish and Marxist. It was such nonsense. Oh, the fundamentalist homeschooling mother says it's nonsense for daughters to stay under their father's roof until they marry. There were so many other glaring flaws. Oftentimes they used scripture quotes that were intended to be commands for our relationship to Christ, and they twisted it to be for our relationship to earthly fathers. Um, isn't the husband supposed to be like Christ? To teach that young women cannot leave their father's roof unless they are married is going far beyond scripture and putting man-made yokes on God's people. No, it isn't. The Bible is our sole authority for faith and practice. Again, they lied. For a young Christian woman to go to a godly Bible college, even though there is no such thing in Scripture, and even to become a single missionary. Sure. Down here again, they say godly Bible college. A single woman can operate under the authority of the church as surely as she can under the authority of a father. Oh, that sounds kind of familiar. Where did I hear that type of thing before? I mean, why don't we why don't we just come right out and just be honest here, David Cloud and your little house church fundamentalist house church mother? Why don't we just come out and be honest and say let's have some Baptist nuns? Why not serving the church? Yeah. Page 243. There is no pattern in the New Testament for a Christian nation. There is a pattern for the church, and he never tells you what that is. Okay. There's the her heresy of modern textual criti criticism, like David Cloud. See the following articles at the Way of Life literature website. Textual criticism is drawn from the wells of infidelity. Modern textual criticism's role in the breakdown of society and the ungodly fruit of modern textual criticism. All of which Cloud subscribes to. You say, well, Brian, he doesn't support the Alexandrian text. I know that. David Cloud isn't going to support the Alexandrian text, but he'll overthrow the King James Bible with the Receptus, the Texas Receptus, the Greek manuscripts that were brought down through the Greek Orthodox system. So that's going to do it for this book. I can say this is one of the most idiotic books I've ever read. Um, he didn't prove anything against the house church movement. All he proved that is that this movement over here is wrong. I could have told you that. I said that back in my video I made years and years ago, how to start a house church based on the King James Bible. I condemned this book in that video, and I will continue to condemn that book. All right. But I'm also going to condemn this nutty nonsense over here. This is lying and just slander and ridiculous idiocy. You know, calling house church, the house church movement satanic, and it's it's being inspired by a higher spiritual force, and then he comes out and says it's satanic, and yet he's lying and lying and lying about scripture, twisting scripture, and, and openly lying right here. This book is garbage. Okay? David Cloud, I really hate to tell you, but you need to check yourself you need to get yourself right before God. All right. The lying that you did in this book, you need to get this thing out of print. All right. Otherwise, you're going to be facing this thing. If you're saved, you're going to be facing this record that you've written here, this lying. You're going to be facing this at the judgment seat of Christ. I wouldn't want to have to face up and give an account for this kind of nonsense if I was you. You better get that thing out of print quickly. Because... Like it or not, David Cloud, the house church movement is going to replace the Babel buildings. 
It's going to happen. You say, how do you know that? Because when the Antichrist shows up, he's going to be causing all the world, the false prophet will be causing all the world to worship the beast. Where do they worship? They worship in Babel buildings, not in house churches. The only people that are going to survive that time of Jacob's trouble are those that meet in the house churches that are meeting underground. Same thing that was going on with Richard Vermbrand meeting in underground churches. And that could happen, by the way, you know, and you say, well, then you believe we're going through the tribulation? Absolutely not. No way. The tribulation is for the time of Jacob's trouble, the, the Jews, the nation of Israel. We're not going to go through that. The body of Christ is leaving before the Antichrist even shows up. So, no, I'm not worried about going through the time of Jacob's trouble. But the point is, we have to pass the baton to the people that are heading into that. All right? And persecution could get very, very bad in America and in the other nations out there before the rapture. We're not going to be in the time of Jacob's trouble, but the persecution could get so bad that we are forced to go underground. And I'm telling you right now, I believe that true Christians are already out of the Babel buildings. And those that are clinging on are clinging on out of tradition. And they're seeing lots and lots and lots of corruption. And they're being vexed. And they're going and they're continuing to go because, well, it's just a thing to do. And I, just, I do have some friends that I get to talk to and stuff like that. But you see the corruption all around you. If you're saved and you're going to a Babel building and you're still clinging to that tradition, you can see the corruption. You say, how do you know, Brian? I went there for years and years and years and held on to the Babel buildings and didn't want to let go and didn't want to let go, even though I knew it was not in the Scriptures. So you see? But God didn't bless me until I finally got out of that system and said, I'm not ever going back again. I'll not go back to Babel buildings ever again. I suggest you do the same. All right, just want to do a quick little add-on here to the video I made exposing David Cloud and his ridiculous house church book. Here's his website, Way of Life Literature Incorporated. There's David Cloud. You go here to the church directory thing down here, and for a ch church to be included on the list, the pastor must fill out our questionnaire. What's the questionnaire? Here you have all these different things. Let me let me zoom in here a little bit so you can see this a little bit better. Okay, going down through here and stuff like this, and a lot of this I would agree with, you know, whatever. But uh, one down here I think is absolutely, yeah, right, right here, number 19. Look at this. Do you reject Peter Ruckman's peculiar doctrine, such as the KJV as advanced revelation and salvation is different in different dispensations? I mean, you know, to be a church that I recognize, you have to reject Peter Ruckman. Give me a break. I mean, what kind of little childish nonsense are you running here, David Cloud? Especially after your book, you show your hypocrisy. You attack Ruckman for believing in the, the inspiration of the King James Bible. And yet you turn around and say, if you're a real, true Bible-believing Christian, you have to believe in the inspiration of the Bible. You know, it's... Just a total stinking hypocrite.